and to give us a very concrete example of what kind of impact investing and what that can look like, we've invited Josephine Gray to talk to us today. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Josephine, and it gives me incredible pleasure to introduce you all to, uh, to Josephine, who has an amazing history in the city of Toronto as an activist and a leader in food security. To give you a little bit of a sense of uh, Josephine, the, um, in, in, 1990, in 1986, Josephine co-founded the Low Income Families Together project. The, um, she's been the executive director of that project. She has gone to the UN to represent Canada. The, she has received the Millennium Award from the City of Toronto for innovative community work. She has received a Woman of, uh, of Honor of, uh, Award from the Black Business Professional Association, and she's received the International Women's Achievement Award for community development. And those are just some of the, her accolades. Josephine lives in this area of Toronto, St. Jamestown. That's the Toronto neighborhood that is south of Bloor Street between Sherburne and Parliament, really centered on Wellesley, uh, Wellesley Avenue. In that area of the city, built in the 1960s, there are 20 high-rises and 25,000 people live in those high-rises from about 100 countries. Many people are, refug uh, are refugees coming to Canada and uh, they settle first in St. Jamestown. So it's an immigrant community. It is surprisingly highly educated. Many people are coming with uh, second and third degrees from the countries they came from. It is also a low-income community and it is underserved. And with Toronto, Toronto's skyrocketing housing costs and with food prices going up relentlessly year over year, some of our neighbors in St. Jamestown regularly have to make the choice between paying their rent, buying medications, or buying food. And often they go to bed hungry. Food security has been a driving passion for Josephine and the St. Jamestown Community Co-op for years. And Josephine is here to talk to us today about a venture that she has thought up in indoor vertical farming that she believes could feed all of St. Jamestown and beyond and can generate a respectable return on investment for investors. So Josephine, welcome. Thank you for talking to us. And let me start off by congratulating you on a winning entry into the Coil Circular Economy Challenge. It's amazing recognition, and not only of the great work that you're doing, but also of the potential of your idea. So to start off with, uh, Josephine, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, your background and how you get to be doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you, Dan. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Let me just uh, emphasize that the ideas uh, that I'm working on are not just mine, uh, they, they come from the community. Um, however, I've gotten involved in this, I suppose, you know, um, as a child, I was, uh, you know, a mixed race child with two white parents living fairly privileged um, life and education. You know, I went to gifted schools, alternative high schools. I worked a lot with horses. I spent a lot of time in the country. I was very aware of issues around farmland and even climate change as my mother was educated about that in her youth. Um, as I became a single parent, um, oh, should I mention that I, I had a, quite a lot of interaction with quite wealthy folks from my work with horses and I could got quite familiar with a whole variety of aspects of society as I was growing up. But as I became um, a mother, um, my children's father uh, developed an illness and then a drug addiction problem. And I found myself widowed and struggling to raise a family. And I became an activist because of that. And I think, you know, from that time onwards, um, given that I couldn't have a career in horses, <laughs> um, especially once I was a mom, I got very involved in trying to address the issues facing other low-income families. And that's why we founded Lyft and then also founded Food Share Toronto um, as I was very concerned about issues of food security and being able to provide healthy food to families. You know, my work subsequently took me to seven continents, to the UN, uh, World Social Forums, and I've learned a great deal from many people around the world and how they come together with solutions. And I've always been very focused on 
how we can work collectively on solutions that directly impact us, but also can provide examples for other communities. So it's been very, um, you know, very gratifying life mission. Um, I remain in the community and I'm now a grandmother. And I guess, you know, some of us just never give up. <laughs> so that's my background. So, so um, how did the St. James Star Community Co-op uh, come about and um, what is it intended to do? Well, we were approached by a lift that does a lot of incubating of projects by and for low income people. And we were approached by some residents who wanted to work on increasing the access of newcomers and low income people to healthy food. Um, they had a little project called the St. James Town Cafe. And, you know, recognizing that it was going to take uh, more than goodwill to uh, make an effect in this area, they wanted us to help figure out how to become more strongly grounded and create uh, capacity for this kind of work. So we did a feasibility study that identified the community enterprise cooperative as the best model for our neighborhood to be able to, you know, develop the on-site capacity for uh, sustainable development and food security. Um, we also did some studies around time banking as a, as a good strategy for um, tracking, uh, monitoring economic value and skills inventories and things like that in a community that has not a lot of money, but an awful lot of skills and talents. And then we um, were able to uh, get a feasibility study grant from the city of Toronto to further develop an idea that we were coming up with called OASIS, the OASIS Food Hub. And that stands for Organic Agroecological Sustainable Integrated Systems. And that study, um, it has been uh, a very important focus for us as we develop our modules in um, sort of the micro pilot sense. So we have a community garden, we have a food buying club, we have a compost system. And um, yeah, we've just been building as much as we can with what we have. And so uh, the co-op is now about 150 members. We have about seven staff and then we've been responding to community needs for emergency food and the like. And uh, yeah, we just continue to grow and build and use our human rights framework to govern ourselves and keep our very, very diverse membership uh, working well together. And, and so um, what is the, uh, the Oasis uh, microfarm network? Well, so there's, there's two things. I mean, the Oasis itself, it's a, a food, it's designed to be a climate resilient full cycle food hub, which can gather, grow, produce and process thousands of kilos of healthy organic food per week, provide green job training and decent work opportunities for community members while reducing greenhouse gases and restoring local soil quality. There's a, a, a lot of components to this ultimate vision. It brings together a variety of technologies. And one of the most important aspects is how do we sustainably grow food um, in a winter country um, in a time when the weather has become very unpredictable and open field agriculture is becoming less and less secure. Um, so the food hub, you know, is designed to address each part of the food cycle, but also uh, creates a model for the community to be able to uh, design, build and maintain and sustain the food hub and generate opportunities from it. So our food hub, you know, it draws together uh, ideas from different parts of the world, you know, um, different examples and models in different cities, even in North America. And it puts them together in one particular model that we think is ideal for uh, low income or vulnerable communities to be able to achieve um, clean food, water and energy for communities, particularly to be able to make it through uh, many emergencies that we have faced and will be facing like extreme weather uh, blackouts and things like that. So it's a kind of a, a big ambitious idea, but the most, yeah, most challenging part is how do we grow that food um, indoors in a climate controlled way that is also organic and healthy. So we have found um, a, a wonderful partner who has a very nicely developed system that's scalable from very small apartment size to shipping container size to larger spaces. And you know we're very excited that 
Um, as we had hoped someone would be able to do, he's managed to get his system uh, certified organic for both the fish and plant products. We um, have had the great fortune of becoming a part of Collegia and Collegia is able to pull together some great partners with us and uh, Nature Harmony, who's doing the food system. And we are devising a micro farm pilot project to be able to introduce and test and develop this technology within the community setting so that people um, are learning about how the system works and we can figure out ways in which systems like this can maximize the community's ability to produce food in a concrete jungle where there is really no access to soil. <laughs> It's a, it's a pretty, um, I'm about to say, a like crazy idea <laughs> that uh, you don't see uh, giant concrete towers. What you see is a, is a giant, massive distributed farm the, with uh, farms in people's apartments and shipping containers in, um, in your back garden and uh, the uh, taking over the parking lots and uh, the, and I, we've seen examples like this, the like Elevate Farms uh, and Aero Farms who've got, uh, who've got um, warehouse size uh, um, indoor vertical farms. So the technology is, is getting there and the, the LED lighting systems um, are getting there and uh, they're all data, data intensive and linked. The, um, so I, I can see how this, this would work and that this is really, it's a, it's a big data. Uh, infrastructure kind of a project. Where really, what we're, you're doing is creating this this living laboratory, and everybody who is producing food is actually producing uh, data that we can then um, analyze and understand how to optimize uh, food production yes. in different kinds of environments. Yeah, I think it's um, you know there's a couple of things that. I think are important features of how we're developing this. And one is that we're trying to make sure that the community uh, can sustain these kinds of projects and continue to evolve and develop them because you know we are all having to do R&D as we figure out how to adapt to extreme weather and other issues affecting our food system. It's also you know, very, very important to us that this model be replicable. So data gathering, data collection, data design is incredibly important to us. So we've We've been already developing um, through a developmental evaluation process. It uses time banking surveys, um, including translators to working with people who are not digitally connected so that we have you know, really real time accurate information about what people need, what, they, what they're able to do, what they need to learn, you know, what the uh, possibilities are. And I think another piece that's key to us, we want it to be as replicable as possible. So having that really solid data, those really solid data systems are key to both running the food hub, but also the R&D uh, development aspects. And I think another point that really matters to us is that we feel that our community is ideal um, as a place to pilot this sort of um, initiative because we speak so many languages, we have 140 plus languages and we're very well connected to the rest of the world. So if there was ever a place uh, to create something that could benefit people around the world facing similar challenges, it's St. Jamestown. And we know that we're a microcosm of the challenges that face the rest of the world, you know, rising migration, food insecurity, inequity and all these things. So we want this model to be um, a beacon of hope and you know, proof of concept that you know, building from within a community and having um, the structures, governance, models, and technologies in place to be self-sufficient and self-reliant and be able to create and produce healthy food is, is so incredibly valuable to, to both us, but also to other communities and to the world. And so the, uh, just as a last question then, uh, the, um... Uh, so it sounds like the uh, really what um, what you are wanting to produce is not just one farm, but a replicable uh, farming business model. The uh, and so what are the the major benefits um, of doing that? Well, once we have a full the full food hub in place, which you know includes things like you know making lovely dishes and sauces and you know social enterprise opportunities, um, it includes being able to sell like 
really nice compost and really good produce also to our wealthy neighbors in Cabbage Town and Rosedale. Like there's a whole variety of ways in which we see this hub becoming um, you know, self-reliant and generating income and revenue for the community. Um, so there's that. And then there's also the fact that you know, as we demonstrate these uh, climate control growing technologies, we can also show how we can have a dramatic impact on reducing emissions, whether they are methane and nitrogen emissions from, you know, conventional factory farming, or whether they are the many emissions involved in people traveling around trying to find different kinds of food, or the obviously the food miles that uh, are generated by importing so much of the food that we eat. You know, the more we can grow on site or locally, you know, the better it is for the climate and for the environment. Um, so there's a, a whole range, we think, of benefits. In fact, when we did an analysis, we find that our model actually helps to meet many of the sustainable development goals, most of the sustainable development goals. And uh, we think that's very important as well because the 17 sustainable development goals are essentially a, a global blueprint for how we can you know, become um, sustainable and manage to you know, adapt to the current challenges we all face. And so again, you know, for us to have a model that reflects and supports those goals, I think makes it also attractive and more replicable. It's it's an amazing vision. It's um, it is like really super out there, the on the scale of uh, well, why don't we grow a a farm on Mars? The but in this case, it's why don't we do a massive scale farm uh, in the middle of in the middle of a city, and uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, through hyperlocal production, but also even more than that, the create um, a long term sustainable solution to what are equally long term problems of uh, systemic poverty, the racial injustice uh, and environmental degradation. Indeed, I mean, one of the things that I, I forgot to mention is that there's acres of underused or unused underground space in this neighborhood. So for us, you know, the only logical place to turn was those underused spaces and that that has the added side benefit of being very easy to control climate and um, keep maintain temperatures and to use off peak uh, hydro and things like that. So, you know, we've seen that, for instance, in the city of Paris is growing mushrooms and underground parking garages. So we know these things can be done and we know that we have the elements that are required. It is, however, really challenging to get, you know, for instance, the city um, or some of the current institutions to be able to respond to these kinds of innovations and adaptations. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why it's so, so important for us to have, you know, good partners like Collegia and Nature's Way and others who can help work this vision with us. Because also, frankly, you know, being a bunch of brown people and newcomers, they don't always sit up and listen to us when we come to them alone. So this is why I think impact investing and this uh, innovation model is so critically important at this time. Um, for everybody, I think there is a virtual way to give a round of applause. <laughs> the, and I just would like to really um, congratulate you on uh, like what is really a, an amazing idea and that it is really starting to come to fruition and um, we are uh, greatly looking forward to being your partner as we move this thing forward to uh, through the first round of the coil uh, circular uh, economy challenge through to the next round and then to finding other sources of funding, including uh, participating in this in impact investing challenge.